Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing look at um, Hearts of Iron 4's Black Ice. And so we're going to keep moving right along here. Um, the flight of Rudolf Hess. Okay, Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess was arrested by Horm Guard soldiers in Scotland yesterday after parachuting from a heavy fighter, um, basically a... a BF-110 or whatever, you know, Messerschmitt 110. Uh, an accomplished pilot, he apparently flew alone across the North Sea, taking care to stay out of radar range before veering west towards Britain. Hess appears to have taken upon himself to negotiate the peace treaty between Britain and Germany, although Berlin denounced him as a madman. He has been stripped of all his political offices. British authorities have not been available for comment. This is one of the most interesting events in history that I know it makes the newspaper headlines pretty big in Britain, but I don't think it's properly historically appreciated um, in the World War II context. Who was Rudolf Hess? And we talked a little bit about this last Sunday during our uh, War Thunder stream. Which got demonetized, by the way. I've not argued, um, tried to get it remonetized, but it did get demonetized. Our debate or our discussion, I guess discussion would be better. We were talking about the National Socialist regime and things. I don't know specifically. I wish they would give me a time code so that, oh, this is what we found to be a problem for... Um, advertisers which also means oh we're not going to promote your your video or your stream up as much as we might now i've not had a demonetize you know directly yellow badge of sadness demonetization in probably a year so and i'm not sure what it what it was or it thought it was that got it demonetized but So we are going to talk about this subject here anyways, because I do think it is important. Rudolph, as far as I know, and that, that's because some of this is still shrouded in mystery. Rudolf Hess was a member of the, um, uh, the Thule Society, or the Thule Geschaft or Gemeinschaft, Thule Gemeinschaft, or whatever it's called in German. It, and I won't go into right here its, its predecessors, but suffice it to say it was an esoteric society. This society is reasonably clear as they are, are members of this society. In essence, this society creates the German Workers' Party in Bavaria, known as the DAP. Hitler is sent to spy slash just, you know, I don't know how much it, uh, you know, a spy to me, and when you use those that term, is that they are to go in to, to infiltrate into like an organization secretly and um, get information about it. I don't know if that was the plan or if it was just um, the plan that Hitler was to go to public meetings and because he did supposedly go, I think, to some other meetings of other parties, public public meetings and report back to the German army. Um, what's up with these organizations? You know, were they communists? Were they right wing? Were they pro German nationalism, anti German nationalism, whatever? I don't know. But. Hitler is sent to the, the D, DAP, and he joins the DAP. 
Well, Rudolf Hess is also a founding member of the DAP. There's like Anton Drexler, um, oh, some other people I'm blanking on names right now. I'm not good at remembering some of the early names in the DAP that are around. Okay, so he, Rudolf Hess, who is not born in Germany. He is born in Alexandria, Egypt. Two German parents that were living, I don't know what, I don't right offhand know what they were doing. I presume some sort of business thing, but they were living in Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt. So his very early years was growing up in Egypt. So Rudolf Hess, yes, he, he's there before Hitler. Publicly, to the German public, he is extremely well-known and very well-liked. I don't know if beloved would be the right term, but um, in virtually all major... Well, I, I say virtually because I don't have the detailed records right in front of me. I don't know if anybody's... I presume somebody has. But most of the... Um, Hitler's speaking engagements, most, especially the major ones, you know, the ones that are like radio broadcasts, not maybe every little, because Hitler at different campaigning times, he would go, you know, go, go give a quick speech over at some, you know, church and say one set of bullshit and then go, go to some German workers um, meeting thing. And, and, you know, th this I'm talking like in, you know, 1930 or 1932 or, you know, one of the, the election campaigning, you know, go talk to some other German workers and say another set of bullshit, often contradicting himself. These sometimes were reported in anti-Hitler -Hitler, anti -Hitler newspapers, but I guess for Hitler and the Nazis, for and probably most people didn't, people read the, the newspapers that agreed with their, their viewpoints, not um, others. So, oh, I should... I'm seeing this here. This is, should not be happening, so we're going to do that. Keep them from being sunk. Um, so, he, you know, running around, expect, politicians used to do this a lot more before the Internet because you wouldn't necessarily get called on your head. And so, and then Hitler would probably, you know, go go to some industrialists and say a different set of bullshit, you know. Um you know, go to the church and maybe throw in the word Christian, but uh, we're going to protect your traditional values. Go to the workers. We're going to protect workers' rights or pay and blah. Go to the industrialists. We're going to make sure you guys get to make all kinds of money, you know. Uh, and, you know, sometimes literally contradict himself. Other times just sort of shade it in there. So, he, you know, so I'm not saying in every little speech, but all the major ones, Hess would come out and do the warm-up speech. He would come out and speak before Hitler. So um, he was extremely well-known uh, with that and extremely well-liked because of that. Now, he was, and at this leading before, um, deputy party Fuhrer, meaning deputy leader, and then deputy leader under Hitler in Germany as a state function after the um, death of Hindenburg. When Hindenburg is still, alive, is still alive, he is president of Germany. Hitler is chancellor, and below him is Franz von Papen as vice chancellor. Vice Chancellor is a job that is mostly not there. I think there was one other time that there was a Vice Chancellorship um, at, during the Weimar period, but it's not like in the United States as always like there's always a Vice President. It's sometimes there's a Vice Chancellor. He's made Vice Chancellor under Hitler. They, they thought with a President and a Vice Chancellor of the same party, not of Hitler's, they could control the Nazis. That didn't work out. But, so, and Hess is just deputy um, party leader. 
Well, after Hindenburg dies, Hitler restructures, the government gets rid of a, a bunch of the cabinet members who are not Nazis. Not all of them. Konstantin von Roth stays around for, for quite some time into the National Socialist, you know, into 36 and later, um, and a few others that do stay around um, in the government, including uh, Helmar Schacht, who's also not a Nazi. He's complicit in Nazi regime, but he is not a Nazi. Um, so there's a restructuring. And with that restructuring, Hess is made deputy Fuhrer of Germany. So he's the number two guy. Meaning if one of these many assassination attempts on, on Hitler's life, um, you know, hap, you know, happens and Rudolf Hess is not killed in it. Rudolf Hess would be, um, the next leader of Germany. Well, wouldn't you know it, Hitler starts a world war. So there's now a war going on. And then, wouldn't you know it, Germany defeats France. There's another restructuring of the government at that time that is often overlooked. During who has been for some time Reich Air Marshal, meaning head of the Luftwaffe. Well, after the fall of France, there is a award ceremony in which the great uh, a large number of field marshals. Uh, are made some of the, um, the some Navy and Luftwaffe, uh, you know, are made like um, other sort of promotions. But Goering is made Reich Marshal. So in 1940 something, you know, after sometime, relatively shortly after the fall of France, uh, Goering is made Reich Marshal, not Reich Air Marshal, not Field Marshal. Reich Marshal, which in essence means national military leader. It's still under Hitler. There's still the oath to Hitler. Hitler's still number one, but he is sort of the old um, Bloomberg type position, the old um, un under the, um, the old Kaiserreich and under the um, Weimar regime, regime, the army was not subordinate to either one of those, was not subordinate to civil authority. And by that, I mean either under the Kaiser, which was definitely military head, and the president, which is definitely military head now, popularly elected, yes, Turns out, most of the time, it's a, you know, general or former military general of Weimar. You have below either the Kaiser or the president, you have directly below him, chancellor, and directly below, also below the president or Kaiser, the, um, the head of the military. And it sort of changed at different times and whatnot. So... Where, like in the United States or in Britain, well, let's let's look at Britain for the moment. In Britain, you have the king because it's sort of similar. You have the king, and then below the king, you have the prime minister, and then below the prime minister, you have, you know, um, you know, uh, foreign secretary and secretary of war. So it's part of the civil administration of the government, and then of course the militaries in Britain, the navy, the army, the RAF are, you know, under the ministry of, um, of the, uh, you know, under the minister of war. Now, it is generally presumed in, say, America or Britain that you might, you might have a former career officer. Often you generally, for your, your secretary of defense in America or during World War II secretary of war, 
generally they've had some military experience, but most of the, a lot, if not, a, you know, a, huge, a very large percentage of, you know, senators and whatever did go into the military, but they weren't career. They weren't there for, you know, 20 years. They did their, you know, did their four or six years or whatever as an officer, and then they were out and maybe futzed around as inactive reserves or something for a time, but they're in and they're out. Well, for the German head of this, this ministry is either a, an active duty military person or someone who's had a long career in the military. And for Germany, it's, it's the army and not the Navy or whatever. So, um, so it's really it's really a separate establishment. You didn't um, you didn't need um, ministerial approval for like uh, like like in the United States the president appoints all the officers. Okay, you you get, but they're at certain level or all level they're confirmed by the Senate. You know there there's not that sort of confirming by the legislature prior to this. I know this is probably more in the weeds than most people want to get, sorry. But this is not how it's re reorganized as far as, again, as far as I know and looking at the organizational charts that I've seen, both in German that look, I think are from the period as well as later. Um, it now goes Hitler, Goering, And then now over to the civil government, deputy leader Hess. So Hess has gone from the number two to the number three position that's basically sidelined. Um, basically, now, oh, also, and I was saying uh, Hess is very popular in, um, in Germany with the people. He, though is not very popular or universally popular in the party because Hess has been the guy who has been um, settling disputes between different party officials, you know, as they argue over things, different branches of the party. And the party is being integrated into it. Okay, Sophia, thanks for hanging out. Do appreciate it. Um, you can come back next week. I hope you've, I don't recognize your name, so I hope you've subscribed. Um, and of course, watch the videos on YouTube. So thank you so much for being here. Have a good day or evening as it may be for you. Uh, so, um, where was, oh, um, so he, he is sort of the enforcer within the party organizations, you know, dispute between the SA and the sort of NSDAP proper or a dispute, dispute between, um, the Hitler Youth and the, um, you know, the, the DAF, the Deutsches uh, Arbeiters Front, or the, the German Workers Party, the, the, the National Socialist Union. He's the one that's sort of, you know, um, being the, the settler of disputes. Yes, at times, if you had enough influence, you might be appe appeal up to Hitler, but normally it's, it's Hess has been doing this. Well, all of these jobs that Hess has been doing is becoming unimportant or irrelevant or not happening anymore because there's a war on that. The party is still functioning. The party is still around, but it's no long. He's no longer, you know. Rep, yes, Hess is a a military veteran, but he is not seen as a military leader, and that is why Goering is put in place. Goering is seen as a military leader, so. If, you know, Hitler is worried that if he is killed, and Hitler does worry about these things, that if he is killed, the army who has had a, and this is sort of why I gave some of the background, has had a tradition of being independent from the rest of the German state, that the army may take upon itself to not pay attention to the succession of the, the Nazi party leader leadership because they don't have an oath to obey Hess or anybody else. But he feels that 
Goering is a good national socialist, including ideologically. I think he was. And the army will follow his orders. So he sees this as a succession plan. Is if he if he's gone, it's going to, to Goering. Okay. So is Hess a madman? Meaning act, acting detached from reality. I don't think so. Now, late in his time at um, uh, uh, Spandau Prison, yeah, he probably is mad by that point. He's been in prison a good chunk of his life. But at this point, no, I don't think so. Now, remember... I mentioned he was part of the um, esoteric society that creates National Socialism. National Socialism is an esoteric religion at its core. Now, do all the party members that, that joined up because they like Hitler's speech or all the SA dudes that wanted to go around and beat other people up, are they believe all the, the esoteric stuff or any of the esoteric stuff? Not necessarily. It isn't. It is not, as far as I can tell, because, again, I don't read German. I don't read all this stuff. But as far as I can tell, it is not generally organized up like the Communist Party with a bunch of people running around um, giving out uh, communist doctrine to everybody. There is not a core of people running around Germany giving, around, or giving out um, esoteric Nazi beliefs to the general population. Now, there is definitely that going on in the SS. And again, to sort of il illustrate this, at one point, at one of the meetings down in Italy that, um, that Hitler goes down and meets with Mussolini, Mussolini asks how does he deal with the church up in, because Mussolini at different times during his career has had major disputes with the Catholic church, how do you deal with the church up in? in Germany. And Hitler makes a remark, um, I don't have any Christians around me. So anybody in the inner circle of Hitler is specifically not Christian. Hitler does not. I'm not saying you can't visit because one of made one of the non inner inner circle, but one of the made functionaries in the that National Socialist Plans, has been Franz von Papen, a devout Catholic. There, initially to control Hitler, doesn't end up controlling Hitler, gets moved out of the government posts after Hindenburg dies. And I think it's 1935, so Hindenburg dies in, uh, what is it, 34, I believe. In 35 he is sent as special envoy down to Austria with the goal of bringing Austria into the union with Germany, Anschluss. Because he is well-known, well-liked, diplomatic, and all of that, and he's a Catholic. Austria is a Catholic German nation. He's down there to charm them. And then, uh, then after that's done, he's sort of looking for a job, and then Hitler sends him down to, well, Ankara or whatever, down to Turkey to be the special envoy to Turkey to try to get Turkey into the alliance. And eventually Franz von Papen decides this is all nuts and starts ignoring Hitler and including ignoring um, orders to come home to Germany late, later in the war. So, but Franz von Papen is never a member of the inner circle. Again, as far as I can tell. Sure, he has meetings with Hitler because, you know, at various stages, um, you know, he, he's around, but he is not part of the inner circle. So Hitler does not allow any Christians to be around him. So it is more of a move. The esoteric parts of National Socialism are much more of a an inner circle. I mean, they go, you give out blood and soil speeches and whatnot that have very esoteric backgrounds, but it's not out there trying to convert the population at whole for its esoteric beliefs. Well, Preishofer 
father and son are the astrologers, etc., to Hess. There's a whole, there is both a campaign against astrologers arresting and putting into camps that people concentrate on things, um, to, um, you know, against astrologers, but there's also approved astrologers too. So it's sort of like they go after the ones that are not in compliance or in agreement with their sort of national socialist religious values. It's sort of the other astrologers that get locked up. Well, the price offer and crew give astrological advice to Rudolf Hess. And Rudolf Hess is seeing his power and his mission diminished. And again, you got to realize Hess, I really think he was set up to be Hitler's handler for the esoteric group, but I think he sort of defects from them into being a Hitler loyalist because Hess, you know, the, the, um, putsch in 1924, you know, um, the Munich Beer Hall Putsch that fails. Um, Hess is arrested along with Hitler. Hess is convicted along with Hitler. Hess goes into Landsberg Prison along with Hitler. Now, the, the Nazis are given sort of a wing or a, a group of cells that are all right next to each other and, to my knowledge, don't get locked um, in between each other. The, the, the sort of wing is locked, but they can visit each other's cells as much as they like. And Hess... Ben's, um, he, he is the person that takes the dictation. Hitler does not write Mein Kampf. He dictates it to Hess. Well, Hess is like, hey, dude, yeah, you've been, you know, you can get out on good behavior. Hess goes, no, thanks. I'll stay in prison. And he stays in prison until Hitler leaves. Um, take, because he is devoted to Hitler and he's taking down Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf is basically written while Hitler is in prison. And so this tells you sort of the devotion to Hitler. And so he is no longer, he feels that he's losing Hitler's trust, Hitler's um, approval, Hitler's whatever. So between the esoteric influences and the pushing aside, he decides to go meet with the Duke of Hamilton. The Duke of Hamilton was a known member of the right club or right circle, or maybe they use both terms, which is a uh, esoteric group that is concerned about the future of Britain. They are not the same group of people and don't necessarily agree with or like Mosley and the BFU, or no, BUF, sorry, BUF, British Union of Fascists. I always say that one backwards for some reason. I don't know. Um, but they're known to be, the right circle is known to be anti-Semitic, very anti-communist. I don't know that they would match up with National Socialists, either entirely the esoteric or the political beliefs, but they are, you know, vehemently against the communists and liberalism. Not that they're so anti-liberalism as, as, a, as a belief system, but believe that liberalism is weakening the society and allowing communists and socialists to take over, all this blah, 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 blah. So he thinks... The Duke of Hamilton is um, a friend and an ally. Well, unlike Mosley and the other fascists, he, he's not locked up at all. Um, they're investigated. The circle's sort of broken up. Some of them are locked up. Um, but Duke of Hamilton is not. He is a, you know, a proud Briton and, you know, never... You know, like Germany in the sense that Germany wasn't going communist, but wasn't, you know, some sort of real fifth columnist kind of thing that, that, that there. Now, 
talk about the and I don't know why they put this damn French airplane just because they don't get a good plane here. So here's here's how it happens. And I know I've gone on long and long about this, but fascinating thing is probably gonna be a special on Hess. And I know I've talked about this before. So he's the deputy party leader. He is um I think maybe has some semi official or official position within the um uh Luftwaffe, but it's not unusual for him to fly um, around. He, he is, uh, uh, like, like it says, an accomplished or known pilot. So he shows up at an airport, and he's doing all this without any organization, without any you know pre-organization, because he doesn't want any, within the National Socialist regime, doesn't want any word of this to come out. He shows up at the airport. He tells them to fuel up. A BF-110 that he can fly by himself. So he is some air, air base somewhere. I don't know exactly where. And they do that. And he takes off. Okay, so he takes off at night. Remember, Germany is in blackout. Britain is in blackout. There ain't nobody, um, you know, uh, having any light shown because of the bombings. So he takes off. And so in complete and utter darkness, meaning you can't like really see coastline or, or water, but he does fly over water. Now it does say, uh, where does it said? Um, he apparently flew alone across the North Sea, taking care to stay out of radar range before veering west towards Britain. Yes. And so instead of like trying to come up and yeah, you might sort of kind of see some, depending on the weather, you might see the moon reflecting off a river or whatever. Or instead of trying to fly along the coastline, you might be able to tell the difference between sea and coastline. He does fly out here. And then he flies because he knows the Duke of Hamilton has an estate. I think it's over in this part of Scotland, but it's in the lowlands down here in Scotland. He, he, he knows that the Duke of Hamilton has, you know, a big, great country house and a large estate. So that he flies out here and he gets, you know, navigates at night. I, I see. Again, he's evil, and this isn't me fanboying over him as I like him, but but I'm fascinated by this. He's flying out at night, you know, coming out, and he flies out, and he navigates himself alone instead of having a navigator sitting in the back seat. He's navigating alone up there, and to the point that he gets up over Britain. He unhooks his seatbelt. He still has the parachute on. He unhooks his seatbelt, and he rolls the airplane upside down to fall out of it. That's the easiest way to get out of, as opposed to trying to climb out on the wing and jump or some crazy shit like that um, because the airplane's going to fly weird. So he, he rolls out, and he parachutes out. You know, So he's falling out upside down until he gets right around enough and he pulls the parachute and he gets down and he lands and he lands either on or very close to the Duke of Hamilton's estate. So it's not just, Oh, Hey, he made it to Britain out of radar range or, Oh, Hey, he's in the countryside. No, he get at night with, you know, again, everything's in blackout. And I do believe this part up here is blackout, but even if it isn't fully in blackout, still, it's not going to be a big, huge landmark. And he gets out. Now, he speaks English. I don't know how well he speaks English because, again, he was raised where for part of his childhood? Alexandria, Egypt, which is, in essence, a British colony. I don't know if he speaks much Arabic. I don't know. And so he falls out of the sky and his plane flies on and crashes somewhere. Well... The way he's captured is, is he approaches in just a, a, a flight suit, I think, with no visible, um, you know, markings on it. You know, no big swastikas or anything. And he asks directions to the Duke of Hamilton's, um, you know, home. But he's near enough. And he doesn't have a local Scottish accent. And people are worried about paratroopers and fifth columnists and all this stuff. So, you know, the guy with his pitchfork um, holds him up until he can get the, the police to show up. And they show up and they find out, yes, it's it. They figure it out pretty quick. It's, it's Rudolf Hess. 
And Rudolf Hess thinks that he's going to get in amongst, all, you know, a bunch of loyal uh, Scottish clan members of the Duke of Hamilton or something, and they're going to secret him to to his estates and then send word if if he wasn't there to get up there and then negotiate get because Duke of Hamilton's friendly to Germany he he thinks and um, negotiates a settlement to become more relevant again with within the National Socialist regime and bring peace. And then, of course, he gets moved down to the Tower of London for a while and then off to somewhere else and just sort of basically kept alone, not thrown in with a bunch of the other captured generals or others later on. And, yeah, so that's that's Rudolf Hess. I think he gets next, he, the next time he gets to see a bunch of his fellow Nazis is during the Nuremberg trials. So, yeah, that is Rudolf Hess, the short version of Rudolf Hess Lice. I know it's maybe long for this video, but um, that is who Hess was. Uh, I, I, that's why I find it fascinating. Okay, let's clear all of these out. And... Hello, Eric. How you doing? Well, I think we will end this here and keep this as a special on Rudolf Hess. And so come back next time for more, yes, more Parts of Iron Black Ice. Thank you, everyone.